Oh, hello, good folks. Hope you're well. Um, okay. Thank you for your continued support and your subscriptions. If you haven't already done so, I appreciate your subscribing. Every little helps. And again, um, any disparaging comments, really, that I find unpalatable and unjust may be valid, depending on how they're written. Uh, I'll either delete them or not. Because if you want to play troll, go play somewhere else. Okay, now we got the unpleasantries out of the way. Um, folks, I've been doing these videos now for nearly <clears throat> three years on and off. And have had different things happen in my life. Two of them being life-threatening, I suppose. Well, certainly one of them. But one of them, well... There are certain things that happen in one's life, I suppose, that um, never leave you. Of course, it's the same for everybody. There are certain things that, if only you could turn the clock back. And then you play if onlys, don't you? If only I'd done this, if only I'd done that, it wouldn't have happened, and various other things. And I think it's only fair now at this stage that I'm legally not obliged to be quiet about this. And looking at a lot of the recent requests I've had, not only from people on YouTube, but from other forums, to when am I going to put my side of this affair that we're going to be talking about, and my feelings, not just my feelings, but the feelings of my family. And yet I was constrained because of certain legal obligations, but now I understand today that I am now free of those obligations so I can sing like a canary. And that is my want in these videos. I shall be doing, hopefully, because it's a protracted story. And you need to know the background. And I hope it's of interest to you, since it was interest in, to certainly in excess of 15 million people in the United Kingdom and many throughout the world, strangely enough. I would point out that I made no financial gain in any association with this family issue. And it sounds like Downton Abbey, doesn't it? But it's not. If only. I wish it were. So I'll just adjust you for a while. So, I'm now in a state that I can, I can sing like a canary, legally. And I think it's about time that people really did know the truth. And what I'm talking about is that as I say, it's quite a protracted set of videos. I'll be doing as many videos as it takes to get to the whole story, the truth, and nothing but the truth. Which in the UK legal system would make a bloody change, wouldn't it? I would also be putting links underneath the videos of details of how you can do even more due diligence. And the subject then subject matter, which I really should have mentioned at the beginning, but I was trying to get you on the edge of your seat, as it were, is that for those of you who are conspiracy journalists or investigators or even theorists, or are just plain nosy bastards, I don't blame you, because the story I'm going to say and tell you here is from the horse's mouth, as near as damn it, and in no way is going to be redacted. I'm going to tell it all. It sounds like Sunday Express newspaper. I really don't mean it. I feel sorry for people who do this, but I'm not getting paid for this, folks. This is my own cathartic way of telling people throughout the world, hopefully, how I feel and how 
the rest of my family feel. So with that being melodramatic and without further ado, I want you to know that this evening we're going to be, well I'm going to be, don't know when you're listening, talking about the motorway madness scene that was broadcast on the telly just over three years ago, I think. More than that. When it was shown on Motorway Cops as TV programme, the arrival, as people saw it in the UK anyway, of two, at the time, blonde females that were twins, albeit not identical, playing around on the M6. To such an extent, the whole of the M6, north and south, was closed. And you can imagine then, for most of the day, it was closed, and that was such an inconvenience to the whole of the United Kingdom. Certainly for the people stuck on the motorway, can you imagine? the loss of revenue, not to mention the piss-off factor for those drivers stuck in it who were simply wanting to go about their own business. So, I am one of originally five boys. I'm the youngest, and the person that was murdered by one of these blonde twins was my older brother, Glenn. And so you're going to hear the true story about exactly the event, the investigation, the shenanigans, for want of a better phrase, that we as a family had to endure. The disinformation, the legal wrangling, and the cover-up. And what part politicians played in this, and what part the legal system had to play in this, and what support both the National Health Service, the medical health service side, i.e. the psychiatric side, and the police particularly, played in the whole nonsense of it all. Now, I don't mind what you've read. I'm not really interested, to be frank, what you read. You will form your own opinion. All I'm telling you is, as far as I'm concerned, and my brothers and mother are concerned, I'm telling you the straight facts. And I'm not really looking for any money, thank you. And nor have we been compensated in any legal form for the loss of my brother. So, from the beginning, shall we begin? Occasionally, I will pop on my vap if that's okay. And it is particularly difficult to rake through this old stuff again, you'll understand. And I've managed quite well to keep it together for the most part. But I love my brother dearly. And I miss him even now, every day. And I'm sure if you've any, ever lost anybody so close as a sibling, um, you will understand. But he has, or his murder has left a big hole in our family that cannot be filled. And he's never forgotten, of course. And yet, the tragedy could have been so easily avoided. But hindsight, folks, as we know, is 2020 vision. So I want you to get yourself a cup of tea, put your feet up, do what you do. And I can't obviously get involved in answering questions because otherwise I'd be here all day. You know, I'd have a strenuous job. And uh, I do these videos and these group of videos, I would try to get it all done in three. But there's only so much you and I can take on YouTube. We'll have to split it up. 
Like an elephant, we're going to eat this one slice at a time. And please keep it in order, one, two, three, maybe four videos. Don't jump and skip because you're going to miss salient points. Perhaps sometimes you'll want to fast forward to get to the juicy bits, only to find that you have no idea of who and what I'm talking about. Simply because I mention names does not mean to say that the people I'm mentioning have been proven guilty or innocent at all. And until they are proven guilty, they remain innocent. But there are certain characters in the whole event leading up and past my brother's demise that remain suspicious to me. One in particular. So, let us start. The situation of our family was that Glenn lived on his own, having undergone two divorces, and probably happy most latterly in his life, his age, living on his own. He'd been there, done it, got the t-shirt with the Air Force, qualifying as a paramedic, and primarily living in Stoke-on-Trent in Fenton, on his own, with his dog. He occasionally had the odd girlfriend, but his absolute passion was his dog, and he enjoyed eventually his own company and that of his friends. And he had quite a circle of close friends. So he was unemployed. At his stage of life, he really found it difficult to secure a job in such a rundown area, such as Stoke on Trent, where unemployment's high, and Glenn's skill set was limited to welding which he did had his own gear to do the occasional bit of welding and uh, naturally he was on benefits and he was always looking for a job he was never idle in that respect but the one thing about Glenn is he was a he was a homeboy he didn't live too far from my mother and father and my brother Paul. Paul actually owned the house that my parents lived in by arrangement, no tax dodge there. He bought it. So my mother and father were there living at the time and Glenn was there and I was for the most part busy doing our job and my other two brothers, Mark and Gary, equally doing their jobs. I used to think how lucky we are, we are that even then there was still five boys and mum and dad. Ain't that just dandy? We've had such a lovely life, a lovely upbringing. And we were enjoying it. My parents were enjoying their retirement. And this went on for some time. And the four brothers who used to help Glenn out was always trying to help and support him. Through tough times too. And he settled down quite happily into civilian life because it's always a jolt coming out of the Air Force, a bit of a culture shock. And uh, he had two sons from his previous marriage, three actually. One he was estranged from through no fault of his own. And the other two... Gregory and Andrew were still running around in Stoke on Trent doing what boys and, well, young men do. And for the most part, Glenn had a good relationship with those chaps. And we still do as a family have relationships with Glenn's children, naturally. Life progressed pretty happily. And Glenn, being Glenn, occasionally got himself into a bit of local difficulty, as we say, because he liked a pint. 
but he wasn't vindictive, he wasn't nasty. But he was intolerant of idiots too, and knew how to look after himself without a doubt, being ex-forces that he was. But he settled down with his dog into a routine, visiting my brother and my mother on probably twice a week, and in the meantime had his own social circle. This went on, and I came back from work one day. Oh, sorry, between then and now, of course, my father sadly died of natural causes, had a good innings. The funeral came and went, and that was it. It was all uh, the whole family's efforts, of course, is to support my mother, who was obviously reeling from losing her husband of so many years. Again, a difficult time by all, but we all clubbed together and kept strong. And fine, my mother was, in seems, in fine fettle, health-wise. She'd recently had heart surgery and was over that and doing terribly well. Still the full Monty, as they say. Sometime later, maybe 18 months down the line, I came home from work one day and my wife said to me, you, uh, you need to take the phone, your brother's on it, Paul, and he's crying. And, you you know, I, ha I, I live nearly two hours away from my brother who lives in Stoke-on-Trent. And I thought, oh, goodness me. I looked at my wife and she just went right there, she know. I said, what did he say? And she said, well, he didn't really speak much. He's too busy crying. Something pretty serious, I suspect. But I took the call in private and eventually... Uh, when he discovered it was me on the phone and not my wife, he said, it's about Glenn. I said, oh yeah, <laughs> what's he done? <laughs> As you would expect. Um, or oh, what's wrong with him? And my brother Paul said, he'd been murdered. Now that's different, isn't it? When you hear he's been murdered. Instead of somebody saying Glenn's died or has been killed or he's been found dead, which put on different connotations, don't they? You build immediate mental pictures of what what could the scenario, scenario be? Oh. I, I sat down, I was on hands free, well, I had the phone, wireless free, and my wife was in the background going, I'll tell you in a bit. As I proceeded listening to Paul, of course, the tears were coming down my eyes, and my wife knew something dreadful was wrong. And um, I was on the phone for Paul, and I, the first thing I said was, I'll be with you as soon as I can. And I let him off the phone, I'll see you. So, okay. Obviously, I didn't want to spend time on the phone to Paul saying what happened, what we found out, what was the circumstances. My first priority was get up and straight down to see Paul and my mother. Um, so, I mean, you know, had a chat with my wife, explained the situation. She got an overnight bag ready for me. Bless her. And she stayed home to look after the, uh, the children. And I shot off. To Stoke on Trent. I, on the way there, I was continually thinking. Well, you know, was it this? Was it that? Had he got involved with some unsavoury people? Was it really murder, or was it suspected? Who's involved? Not a clue. And to be honest, at that stage, I didn't have any idea of the day's news either, with the motorway being shut. Indeed, I got to Stoke-on-Trent in almost in record time, as you'd imagine. Surprised I didn't get a ticket. But I 
could always pull the fast one. And uh, fortunately, by good grace, I got there and went into the house to really see my mother sat there on the cities, totally stunned, having received the news less than three hours ago, staring at the wall. Hello, no one in, no one home. And my brother's there, he's very upset, and of course, Glenn's dog <laughs> is there. And um, he'd be found running around stray. And the strange thing is, I said to Paul, how, how you know, he explained to me the situation that Glenn uh, apparently, it seems, um, had been found or, or was held in dying in the arms of his neighbour at the back of his terrace house where he bled to death from stab wounds to the chest and his neck. Well, you really don't expect this. Glenn's not a crook, he's not a drug dealer, he's not an alcoholic, he's had no criminal record, he's never been in prison, he's ex-forces, he's as clean as a button, and he's got a heart the size of Texas, would willingly help people. He's from the caring profession, and he's ex-Air Force, he's hardly a thug. So who could have possibly done this? What was the motive behind this? This is the tough one. All things go through your head. Why? Why? Who was it? Why? This was all going on in our minds. And I speak collectively. Before long, of course, my other brothers arrived on the scene, maybe a couple of hours later, but in the meantime, I managed to find out of Paul what happened, because he was first on the scene. And why was he first on the scene, you would think? Why is he first to know? Well, naturally, my mother and him live in Stoke-on-Trent, and it's well known that Glenn used to visit them. Naturally, the police would know who he is, and put two and two together, and, yeah... He wasn't reported missing, but I think some of Glenn's friends did say where Paul came from, because they used to walk their dogs regularly together, did my brother Paul and Glenn, along the canals in Stoke. And uh, they were very close, particularly the latter years, anyway. I'm the youngest of the five, so Glenn really is one but... Well, he's the second oldest, so I'm the last, as you can do the maths. So I said to Paul, how, how did you know? And he said, well, I didn't really until later on, because I had no idea. I, hadn't, I knew Glenn was going to come round tomorrow, and I was walking the dog. And I walked past the paper shop. This is in the evening, after he'd finished work, Paul. And he saw on the paper seller's stand, news headlines... Six o'clock paper, I suppose, the Sentinel. Um, murder, Fenton, murder, blah, 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 headlines. Man found, you know, or stabbed to death, blah, blah, blah. And Paul just looked and then stood back and realised that the terrace house on the photograph was Glenn's house. His heart quickened. He bought the paper dashed home, which is 500 yards away from the paper shop, and sat in incredulity and read this. He immediately, he didn't tell my mother at this stage, he immediately drove to Glenn's house, which is 10 minutes high speed, to be greeted by lots of coppers saying, who are you? The whole of Glenn's place was cordoned off. You couldn't get around the back of his house. Bearing in mind it's the back terrace, there's hardly a huge garden. Imagine Coronation Street terrace houses. You know. Glenn had a two-up, two-down house. He was very happy there. 
living alone with his dog, no hassle. Had a lot of friends, close friends, some really good friends. And I knew them and I sought them to be good too. And I said, Paul, well, when did this happen then? He said it happened yesterday. He was discovered yesterday, was reported yesterday. I thought, well, how come we haven't been told? How come, Paul, you found out from a newspaper and they were told, and the whole of Staffordshire, including the rest of this country online, were told about this before the family? That's a bit odd, isn't it? And the next question is, when Paul got there and explained, and they sent Paul after Paul wasn't allowed in the house, wasn't around, had to say, look, we know who you are now. Thanks for turning up. We crime scenes are in there. Go home or we'll send some family liaison officer round to bring you up to speed. Paul wanted to see Glenn and he couldn't because, to be frank, he'd been taken to the morgue and awaiting post-mortem, no doubt. So access to Glenn's place was like CSI. That It was worse, apparently. And, of course, the dog was seen there and Paul picked him up and took him back. So, obviously, by the time everything got home and settled, Paul and I and brother Gary and Mark, we're all together. My mother is absolutely not on the planet. She's not on, not sedated. She's just gone very quiet. And it's almost like she's in a state of shock and very worrying, of course. And we had some neighbours come round to look after her and give her a sweet cup of tea and all this. Very close to Glen Schwartz. They were, they were extremely close. So, we're thinking, well, the biggest paralysis we have in the family is not knowing what the hell's going on. Who did it? Who did it? And the only thing Paul said to me at the time, in fact, there are the brothers as well. We sat there having a coffee, reeling at the cheek of this newspaper. How dare they publish this without telling the family? Because they discovered who Glenn was. They'd had his name from friends. And yet, somebody in the police, or the scene of crimes, or that area, somebody that must, in the police force, let slip who it was, what the injuries were. Was it a man or a woman who was the deceased, the victim? Somebody blabbed from the police and the scene of crime. Difficult to find out who. But who else has access? It certainly wasn't the neighbour whose arms Glenn had died in, which we'll come to later. So it's like Cluedo. We were trying to put these pieces together, but the seething anger inside particularly me, about this. This isn't right. Some head has to roll about this. But it put it to the back of the mind because it was hardly on a priority thing to sort out, but I would make a note that I will find out hooker by crook who told the press. And why was it in the press before the family were told? That is insensitive, to say the least. And caused a lot of heartache. Imagine. I'm sure you can. There's not a lot we can do. Here we are, all of us. Relatively recent departure of my father. Mother's in a state of shock, having just got over that and having got over her heart surgery. Doesn't really want the hustle and the shock. But is she almost oblivious to the fact that Glenn's been murdered? Not killed here. This isn't a killing in that sense. It's not a fight. And he came off the worst, folks. This isn't the way it went. 
This is a blatant murder. Cold blooded murder. As you'll find out later. You tend to rack your brains, don't you? Because they say that if somebody who dies in a family, it, that death would minimum, minimum, affect a minimum of seven other people, so, you know, who have known the person who's died. As a minimum. Obviously, if they've got lots and lots and lots of friends and lots of responsibilities, and people who are reliant upon them, naturally, their departure, their murder, would affect a lot more. But a minimum of seven people affected. Well, immediately. <laughs> There's me and my brothers, my mother, and Glenn's sons, and his friends, and Glenn's extended family of cousins and aunties and uncles, are naturally going to be affected as we'll talk about later. So we were sat there like mushrooms, really. Fed on shit, police sending us home, not allowed to get in or have a look around in case the scene of the crime is sussed, and damaged or whatever, contaminated. And it was told to get lost. We're doing our bit and we'll come and see you when we see fit. There's anything new to tell you. This is how it operates. Well, that's not a lot we can do after another cup of tea. We can talk about it, we can theorise, but then Paul said something special. He said, you know, is there anybody who hated him? What's this got to do with, you know, Glenn, what, what, who hated him enough to do this sort of thing? We couldn't figure it out. Who was he upset? And Paul said, the only thing I can think of is this girl that was in his house. <laughs> That's what? What? He said, yes. He says, um, you know, what planet you been on, John? <laughs> Have you not seen the news from yesterday? I said, no. He says, oh, this girl, you know. Um, got my timing wrong here, I think, but basically, Glenn was killed a day and a half after Sabina run on the motorway. So, effectively, I was there, and by the time we get to hear this, um, it was well known, and Paul was saying, the only person I can think might have done this is Sabina Oaks or been involved, or knows anything about this. I said, well, hang on, who is this woman? <laughs> and my brother went on to explain what had happened, and I said, how strange. Well, I'm not really watching the news, you know. I've never watched television. I don't listen to the news. I get my stuff on the internet, and this obviously hasn't gone onto the net yet. And I was totally oblivious, to be honest with you. As was my other brother's. This was news to us. What about this girl? Who is she? What is she doing in Glenn's house? And he's... Anyway, Paul basically said that he'd met this girl who was having a bit of an issue, crying about her sister. Um, apparently he knew nothing did Glenn... Nothing was discussed with Glenn about the sort of reason that she's running around Fenton looking uh, homeless, really, with a bag, lost, penniless, as it transpires she is certainly not penniless. But Glenn, she struck up a conversation with him, talk about serendipity, and she was crying, and got a bit upset. And Glenn being the softy that he said, it was come on home, We'll sort this out. And he phoned my brother Paul and said, there's this girl here in my lounge. And Glenn didn't have a car at the time, although he could drive. But he said, Paul, you you know, you, uh, you wouldn't do me a favour being 
uh, you know, in the position you're in at work, could you make a few phone calls and see what's happened to her sister, Ursula, who was involved in an accident? That's all that was said. And is in ITU at the time, conscious or not. Well, the NHS being the NHS, don't discuss other people unless you're a relative, provably so. Fair dues. So Paul basically said, well, I can't really, but what I'm happy to do is come round and pick you both up and drive you to the hospital. And then that girl, Simeon, can go in and check for herself. And me and you, Glenn, we can perhaps have a fag in the car park. OK, that sounds like a plan. And while Paul was holding on and waiting for a reply, with Glenn holding his hand over the telephone, he said something to, as it transpires, Sabine Erickson. And she said, you know, not evidently English, a slight accent. And Glenn said, well, she seems to be too tired now, so she'll perhaps go tomorrow, but thanks for the offer. See you tomorrow, click. Last words to Paul. Thanks anyway, mate. See you tomorrow, click. That was it. That's the last words that Paul heard of his brother. So we can now, I suppose as a family, think, well, when did this death happen? It happened between the yesterday morning, late morning, and early on the day they found him and was reported dead by his neighbour whose arms he died on. And that would be the police's job to look all that. I mean, as a family, we just knew he was dead and he'd been, it was um, something fishy going on. And was it this girl? Who is this girl? <coughs> we eventually, after a late night and a lot of drinking, <laughs> yeah, to get to sleep, we couldn't sleep any of us. My mother was still in a state of shock. A morning come. And knock, knock, knock at the door. Police car outside. I thought, oh, I wonder if there's any news, as you do. Excuse me a second, folks. In comes this six foot six built like a British house, Brit, chic, brick shit house. Family liaison officer. Let's call him Chris. He knows his true name. And I'd never heard of such people, family A's off. So, I mean, I've never been in trouble in my life with the uh, boys in blue. And uh, I can't get in trouble with the boys in blue. I'd be out of the jobs that I do. So, I'm one of those unfortunates who cannot have a police record in their job of any kind. Or watch it. So, yeah, come on in. And he waltzes in, introduces himself to my mum, my brother, and, you know, and uh, he sits down, and we're all ears, as, well, as you'd imagine. Uh, we're all sat there, and my mum's sitting there, and she's still in a state of shock. I mean, she's just not on the planet. The doctor had since been and gave her some sedatives, and it was almost a blessing, really that she was out of it, and she was drugged out of it. Best thing, I think, given her the tenuous state of recent cardiac surgery. And I don't know if she would have taken it, really, but there we are. So the boys went in to look after mummy mode, I suppose, and, you know. And we're all there. It was just the boys, none of the wives, just, just the lads. And the wives were keeping homes, of course, and looking after things while we all clubbed together. Well, Chris, what's going on? And we're, you know, Chris explained what had happened the day before. In fact, the day before the day before, when these two girls, um, you know, they suspect that they did know that Sabina had been helped by Glenn 
uh, during uh, just after the time she was ejected from Fenton Magistrates Court and being charged with an affray, about a £15 fine. And that's for bringing the motorway of Britain's main artery, North, M6 North, and southbound to a complete halt all day. Not to mention messing around on the motorway and causing havoc and punching a female police officer. Televised. Get that. Televised. You've all seen it, I'm sure. You've seen by now, if you haven't watched the links below, of the actual arrest of these two girls, women, on the M6 by the police, who just happened to of that same day, what a coincidence, nothing to worry about, have a film crew in the back of the car. Well, there we go. What a coincidence. Well, there were so many questions. You open a folder and write the questions down, one after the other after the other. These are the questions we're going to be hammering at, shooting at. Chris, the family layers officer, we want answers. Of course we do. You would. I want to know why she did it. If it was her, what proof do they have? Does she have a grudge? Did she know him? Did he know her? All these questions. We're grasping at straws because we know nothing. And the police are not telling us a thing. Where are they from? One minute they're Swedish. Next minute we've been told they're from Southern Ireland. Maybe Cork. Oh no, we're back to Swedes again now. But one of them lives in America. Ursula. Where's this other one live then? Are they really sisters? Are they really twins? Are they really Swedish? Or did they have an Irish accent? Or is it all a big game for them two girls? Where are they? Like, spring out of fresh air. Where do they come from? Uh, do they have a police history? Are they looking at the film Super Soldiers? Certainly not Ursula. She wrapped her legs around the back wheel of a lorry. And then ended up in intensive care, never to dance in the Dancing on Ice programme again, I dare say. Critically ill. And here, her sister, after witnessing her sister, Eric Ursula, dive under her in the fast lane of a lorry, of course, Sabina decides to go one better, perhaps, and jump in front of a car in the slow lane as a police person or whoever it was stopping her jumping. She slipped out of the code of magic colours and smack got hit by a car in a slow lane, being knocked unconscious. The person driving the car, coincidentally, that hit Sabina was a doctor from North Staff's Hospital. What a surprise. Genuine coincidence. Sabina, we know, was knocked unconscious. Okay. This was all caught on police camera. I put on the telly. You'll see it in the video. There were theories all over the place. Bearing in mind Glenn was alive and kicking when this was going on, happy doing his thing. Okay, so let's just put him to one side for a moment and look at the events on the motorway. I don't know if you know Kiel. The most famous thing about Kiel is the municipal golf course, as I'm reliably told. And the second famous thing is the university, which is where the Open University summer camps happen. Yes, it's a bit like Bohemian Grove with carpets. And it's a mixed race, it's not just boys. So those doing the Open University go there for a summer bash. I mean, nobody really truly admits getting a degree from Kiel. You know what I mean? Anyway, without being cruel to Kiel, these two girls, it transpires, as this is the this is the police story, okay, which we will correct later. But I want you to see the disparity between what we were told and what actually is the truth. But you'd expect the truth out of the police, wouldn't you? Call me old-fashioned, Your Honour. 
Oh yes, boys in blue, they don't lie, do they? Heaven forbid. No, 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 far too ethical. Dead straight, everything by the book. On the 15th of December, Your Honour, you know, they've got a little book and they can't deviate, can they? What's in the book? It's in the book. That's it. Thank you, PC Plot. Now you can leave court. Thank you. Leave it to the grown-ups now. Off you go. Well, there's a strange thing. Is that the CCTV cameras then were, it transpires, I mean, there's nothing like hindsight 2020 vision, is it? But this is found later, but what I'm telling you in advance, so you can put the puzzles together. One moment they're running around, um, going northbound, and they were rejected. Apparently, they were coming on their way down to London from Liverpool, having got the ferry, and the night before, apparently stayed the night in Liverpool, and then jumped across town, got on a National Express bus, and towards London. Apparently they had tickets destined for London, these two. And they were loud and boisterous on the boat, on the, um, uh, one would assume if they'd come from Ireland, of course, they'd been on the ferry and, you know, stayed the night in uh, Liverpool, don't blame them, great city, and here they come, trudging down on a National Express bus. The driver was getting wholly irritated with these two, Sabina and Ursula. First of all, they looked suspicious because they wouldn't put their hand baggage, that's all they were carrying, and Sabina was holding her baggage by her chest like some baby being protected, as though she's carrying something rather valuable, which she was. Including a laptop, of course, and other things we'll talk later. Her sister was travelling a bit lighter, and... Um, they were so boisterous and offensive on the bus that the National Express bus, which doesn't normally make a scheduled stop at Kiel services, folks, was so angry with the pair of them, he stopped and kicked them off the bus unceremoniously. And when he was asked why, he said because they were offending and getting quite noisy and aggressive and mouthy. They weren't drunk. They were just gobbing off and making fun of everybody. And he wasn't going to have it. So he ditched them and run and left these two maniacs, the two girls, stranded at the services. Picked up, I might add, on CCTV. During their messing around and having a cigarette, it seems that Ursula and her sister, Sabina, were making idiots of themselves in the car park and approached the shopping centre type or coffee bar um, maybe to go and get a coffee. Who knows, eh? Stranger things happen to see. And yet they were notice acting before they went in as rather peculiar by the security staff of the um, services. And the manager was called and the manager went on to phone the police and say, there's two girls running around. They've gone around the back of the services where no general public go. They're sniffing about and they're looking like they want to bury something, like they're carrying a bomb, and I'm sure they've got an Irish accent. Well, you can imagine, can't you? Look at the fuss that happened down the toll road with some guy's cigarette electric fag caught fire, didn't it, apparently? And they shut the bloody toll road all day because some guy's electric fag apparently caused smoking on a bus. Heaven forbid. No, he was trying to quit. But they shut it, didn't they? Think it was a bomb, a terrorist activity, you know? And it wasn't an electric cigarette, allegedly. What a fuss. Well, can you imagine if that call's being called then into the police? That Laurel and Hardy get off their ass after eating their burgers in Burger King and come and blue light themselves up to Sabina and Ursula to say what the fuck's going on and get in the car and what are you doing on the motorway? Get off, I will take you off and dump you. You're tr causing trouble. No, what happened was... Billy and Bobby, the flower pot men, turn up, still wiping the tomato sauce off their chops, no doubt. 
pissed off they had to leave a few chips. Asked the girls, apparently in full earshot of the manager of that place, the kill services, and saying, you know, who are you? What are you doing here? Blah, blah, blah. Not one request to see their ID. Not one. What's your plan? Oh, we're going down to, you know, whatever they said. Mumble, mumble. They were told, get this, to get their way and leave the service station. Now, whether Billy and Bobby assumed that Ursula and her sister had a car in the car park were just simply pissing about. No. So what do they do? They get in their car, their police car, woof, they're off again. They're so busy, aren't they? Lowell and Hardy. Obviously, seeing if they can get back and get in the bin and get their burgers out that have been thrown out 25 minutes earlier. And Sabina and her sister proceeded then to carry on walking Get this, southbound. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Northbound. At the same place the bus dropped them off. Why were they going northbound if they were intending to go to London? They're not thick, these two. Trust me. Wow. What is the attraction for them to walk? northbound. And remember I said they're not stupid, as it transpires. Who were they trying to get to? Why were they trying to get there? Well, northbound slightly of the M6 Kiel service station, folks, if you go northbound, and then run up the embankment of the motorway and take a couple of short field trips, country, you'll get to a big um, gypsy camp. I say they call it a pikey station, for want of a better phrase, but yes, travellers. And these are the major, major encampment, I suppose, of travellers, from what I've been gathering, of the piking fraternity, yes, the travelling community, which it transpires was the originating point of Sabina and her sister. Hmm. Well, there we go. They must know that tinkers tend to look after each other and that's where they're going. But they had enough money to go to a hotel, holiday inn or something, or, or just get a taxi. Or why didn't the police escort them off and find them the nearest bus station in Hanley and Stoke-on-Trent to get them on another bus, or indeed take them further south to Stafford and let them get a bus there, if London was truly their destination. No, 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 no. They were left like catch and release fish. But a little bit of history we weren't told at the time is this isn't the first involvement that Sabina and her sister had had with the police since arriving on the UK shores. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, apparently they came on a ferry. Unremarkable journey. And made a beeline for the local, get this, the local police station. Bearing in mind also that us as a family never knew this. So way down the line. And only then by accident and our own due diligence. We had working with us at this stage, latterly, an extremely good investigative journalist, Dave McCann. Top man. Who made himself known to me and I made arrangements that he would actually not so much be a private detective, but David seen a few of these things before and was great moral support for everybody and became a close friend of the family too. And what he didn't know about smelling a rat investigation as a Mackenzie friend, they call him. Do your own checking, Mackenzie friend. He became very close to our family and still remains close. 
because of his fantastic abilities and true reporting style as an investigative journalist. But I'm just telling you what, in the order, what was coming our way was a storm of disinformation from the police. Not only the police, the legal system, as will become clear as we go on. So here we are, reeling, hearing this for the first time, but not knowing everything. It's a little bit like a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. You just need to know a little bit more. This always been held, and the police never volunteer information. They wait till you've nearly got it out of them, then they come clean. And then they wait for you to wheedle anything out of it, and they come clean. They'll never just regurgitate everything you need to know. They will work on this, what they call a need-to-know basis. Do you need to know what you're asking me? No, I'm just being a dozy bastard. Well, I'm not telling you the answer, because you don't need to know. It's not in your pay grade. Do you know what I mean? This is how they operate. How very dare they? This is my brother who's been murdered, allegedly. And here you are playing silly buggers with silly little rules. Don't tell me you don't know, Chris. Because believe me, Chris has his morning briefing every morning about what they found and what they suspect and where these two bastards come from. Oh boy, do they know. And you'll know. Upon arrival off the ferry, the first thing these two girls do, I say girls in a loose sense, folks, maniacs, is they walk into the local police station, caught on CCTV in Liverpool, and Sabina jumps up onto the counter. Wow, bugger me. Most people go and stand there quite politely and say, can I help you out? Yes, please, officer, I've got this up. The other problem? No, she jumps up on the counter. Much to the surprise of the sergeant at the desk, and, well, <laughs> now you're here, you may as well say what you want. Or well, he said it in Liverpoolian. And she claimed that she'd been and running away from there, being chased by, by these horrible people in Ireland, been chasing them to kill them. And they're in fear of their lives. And furthermore, Sabina has a child in a caravan in Ireland. And her husband, one of the biggest alleged, bullshit or not, biggest drug dealers, gangsters, pikey types. Big boxer. Uh, and he's six foot six and he's black. And he's, he's after us. We're on the run. We're on the run. We need help. We need help. The police took notes and they were told to go away and stop causing trouble. They were evidently come across as pranksters. That was the explanation. Now, if I was the desk sergeant, I would have taken it seriously. At least I'd have been on the phone to the guarder in Ireland. No, no, he kicked these two out after he'd been out to make a phone call and back. And he said, oh, you know, look, I know about you two. Get out. You're always causing trouble. Explain that one. Much to the annoyance of Sabina. So they ended up having to go across the other side of town to go and find some accommodation or find entertainment. Obviously went to the Liverpool's uh, Beatles you know, venue or whatever. And then that morning they pissed off to get the National Express bus. Okay. So there is evidence of them getting off the ferry, going into a police station, Sabina acting strange, Okay, being pulled out, being told to fuck off by the police, go and grow up and stop causing trouble. We know all about you two. Off you go. Despite Sabina's claims that her son had been kidnapped, being held hostage by the biggest nasty bastard in Ireland. As it transpired, Sabina's fella was a nice guy. An extremely nice guy. And has never lifted a finger to hurt anybody. And furthermore, she doesn't have a little kid. There we go. She had a son, but not little. Not little. We're not talking spring lamb, Sabina Erickson here. So this is how they got down to Stafford. Keel, sorry. And now they're on the loose again. Okay. They continue leaving the pikey camp the following day 
and they start walking southbound. Woo, 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 Mr. Pikey, this Mr. Copper turns up this time, doesn't he, with the film crew. Hello, what's happening here? Here we can see the motorway protection squad, those who can't have any power of arrest, of course. Yes, the retired copper jobs, highway patrol. Yes, chips. Here he is. And Sabina and her sister puffing away, as we see on the film. And what a coincidence, the police car that arrives, of course, to find out what the crack is, has got the film crew in the back. And Billy and Bobby at the front doing the blue light, saying, oh yeah, we've arrested a, uh, we, you know, got a couple, which they alleged not they didn't know, of course they didn't. Um, oh, it's them two again, shit, I'm going to explain this away, we've got film crew now. Yeah, here they are, the two of them, puffing away. Unrestrained, stood on the fast lane, uh, sorry, on the hard shoulder, Fold the arms, two maniacs. Who, who, who the police know? Puffing away. If it had been you and I, folks, the first thing you do then you get taken out of your car or get caught on the motorways, you're put for your own safety's sake either in the cop car with the door locked or they get you on the other side of the barrier, don't they? Off the uh, slow, if off the uh, emergency lane. Now, these two idiots have stood there watching traffic in the slow lane, middle lane, fast lane, going by. Pissed off, having a fag. And while Billy and Bobby are getting chatted to by the brain cell and the film crew, suddenly Ursula decides to run, 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 much to the, oh my God, of the coppers, gets caught on camera running straight under the path heck of a run right in front of an articulated or articulated lorry smashes his brakes on finds a life out of him dunk, 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 and she gets wrapped around the rear tire of the juggernaut and amazing talk about luck of the devil she's not dead Sabina, as her sister's just about to hit the lorry in the fast lane, equally goes to run also like she's following her and gets caught short by the woman or somebody who was holding on to a coat. And she slipped out of the coat and ran bang into the path of the car coming in the slow lane. Hit, hit the windscreen, smashed, knocked unconscious. Fortunately, the car in the slow lane driven by a sensible person, who was rubbernecking as well, of course. Um, I didn't expect Sabina jumping in front of her, but I think Sabina was heading for another faster, la faster lane, but got caught short. Nonetheless, she gets ending up face down on the floor, unconscious. Naturally, priority has to go then, with the whole motorway stopped, of course. Everybody's curious, blue lights going on. People go, oh my God, oh my God, what's going on? And everyone's looking at Ursula and the poor, poor man whose life was destroyed. The lorry driver, can you imagine? See, they saying it wasn't me, Guff. And we, you know, we know, don't worry. She was evidently keen on committing suicide and doing a run-up. Maybe she would have got to the other side. Was it, was it uh, Russian roulette? Was it like uh, Death Race 2000 or something? What? Playing chicken? No, the motorway on the M6 northbound at that time is very busy. So it was an evident suicide attempt, I think. Why? Why? When they had an agenda to go to London, yet here they are trying to knock themselves off. It was an evident suicide attack uh, a attempt to me. And Ursula was leading the way as the dominant twin, I think. I say they weren't identical twins. And Sabina followed. And Sabina was kept covered up, of course. We saw the film. You just watched the video. I don't have to repeat it for you. And there's all sorts going on. And Sabina refuses to be withheld once she regains consciousness. The amazing thing about this woman is that if it had been you and I, oh, we would have gone, oh, my head. Oh, God, where am I? Am I dead? You know, no, no, no. She doesn't want to be restrained. She gets up as though she's tripped up in Tesco's. 
uh, brushes herself off and starts to create a problem. She then realises, and she doesn't want to be restrained, she keeps asking for the police. Where's the police? Well, hello, got badge, look, police. And I'm sure she can read English. But no, she just sees for us and jackets, and who are all these people? What's going on with my... Well, and she does a run after they try to restrain this maniac again. Now, you could be forgiven to say, is she on drugs? Is she... Is she on... What's going on? You're walking down the bloody motorway, quite happy, pissing people off, maybe waving and clipping people's wing mirrors as they drive by. And that's why they were stopped and pulled onto the hard shoulder. But they were there, two girls having a fag. Do you normally leave two women on the edge of the motorway having a fag that have previously day been kicked off the service station for dodgy behaviour by Billy and Bobby from the beef burger shop? How many times do they need to be told these two to get the fuck off the motorway? And what are they doing here? Why, why don't they get rid of these two? No. One ends up, doesn't she, Ursula, straight down to North Stas Royal Infirmary Trauma Unit. Absolutely unconscious. Like a bag of spanners. In bits. Not that bad. She had a big muscle missing on the back of her car for one stage, I knew. But I didn't pay any heed. But Sabina is a different game. Sabina, it seems, and this was caught on film, jumped over the central reservation of the opposite traffic and was chased by, or tried to stop, jumping over the central reservation by a female copper who got decked in one punch. Sabina seems to be a girl that's had some hard physical fighting experience. Well, she's a pikey, for Christ's sake. Come on. Come on, bare-knuckle fighting. The girls do it too. And you don't want to mess with Sabina. Hard as nails. Now, that's, I'm not saying she's a super soldier or something strange. Is she an idea? You know, she's something like just arrived on the planet like a fucking beam of light and here they are these two no there's a history to this woman which we'll find out later but it'll blow your mind as it blew ours she clocks this female in one punch a woman police constable you and I had done it we'd be in the nick we'd have had ten coppers on us spraying CS gas in our face with tasers <coughs> And these police, these police, by the way, they have arms, arm response units, folks. And here they are, fighting. It took six police and members of the general public to get Sabina back over the uh, dividing line of the motorway, central reservation, and handcuffed to such an extent she could be rumbled in the police car. And off she went. But she was taken straight away, not to the police station. She was taken for a medical checkup because the police have what they call a duty of care, of course. You see? And she gets taken into A&E hospital. She actually, <laughs> amazing, is video cameraed and seen chatting quite happily with PC Plod, who's taking her to a &E. It wasn't an ambulance. Where she gets out casually and is flirting with the copper. Goes into a and &E and refuses treatment point blank. Wants to know, where's my sister? Where's my sister? Nothing wrong with me. Leave me alone. I don't want any treatment. I'm not hurt at all. This is a woman who was hit by at least a 30 mile an hour car and smashed her head hard against that window and was knocked unconscious. Now, I know because I'm into medicine. I know the procedure of admitting trauma patients. I know the procedure of trauma surgery and where the end lies. But equally, the hospital by law has a duty of care, as the police do. Any public servant does who's interacting with the public. 
In a caring profession, you have a duty of care. The priority must be to the patient. The moment Sabina walks into that trust and gets logged on, she is a patient. That patient, in order to unlog, has to sign a release form, releasing the trust from all responsibility if Sabina refuses treatment, which she does. Not only that, she spits on the staff, she's aggressive, in for a fight, and does not want treatment. And all, get this, doesn't even mention her sister. That comes from good authority from the one of the nurses that was present during Sabina's little visit to A&E at North Staffs Hospital. She was released back into the custody of the police. Oh ho ho! Film crew at the ready. Off she goes to the police cell. Okay. Knowing that the following morning she'd be appearing in court if before then, of course, she'll be deemed fit to appear. Now, who is responsible for medically checking to see if a loony, I use the word loosely, a violent person like Sabina Erickson is mentally fit, mentally and physically fit enough to attend court in front of the big in the morning in the matchries? On what charges? Nobody knew at this stage, of course. But the bare minimum was look at the assault. Look at it. she's got to go down for thirty days or something. But no, 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 no. In order to say that she's fit, mentally fit, you get two GPs and a psychiatric nurse arriving. What? Well, this is standard procedure. Well, normally it's the police surgeon that does it, the doctor, isn't he? Cause, but no, why the psychiatrists? And do you know what? She was deemed fit to attend court the next morning and spent Her Majesty's pleasure asleep at Fenton Police Station. Could have been Stoke. Close. To appear at Fenton Magistrates in the morning. In the meantime, Sabina's in critical care. Uh, sorry, Ursula's at critical care. Transpires that Ursula actually lives in America and was visiting her sister in Ireland before they both did a runner. And Sabina at this stage hadn't yet met my brother. Times were about to change. Sabina does indeed appear in court the next day in front of the beak. Now this beak must have been briefed about what's led up to Sabina being there. Surely, surely there must have been some documentation or report. And if there wasn't, there should have been one generated for the magistrate who just got out of bed and had his cup of tea. And so what's going on here? Who's this young lady? Yeah, yeah. James? Oh, Your Honour, you know. I can just see it now. I didn't go to the court. Obviously, I had no reason to go to the court. A bloody idiot. I wasn't involved with her. But it transpires that she was kicked out with a 15, 20 quid fine for a fray. Not a word about assaulting a police officer. Not a word about the putting people's lives in danger or having the whole of the M6 North and South closed and the hassle that these two idiots had put people on the National Express through the inconvenience, not to mention a cascade of events that led up to the event of a sister wrapping herself around a lorry. Imagine the traumas that these two to that point it caused. And what did she get? 15 quid. And she's turfed out like a pigeon. Woof! Off you go, girl. But she kicks out, she's kicked out of Fenton Magistrates not having a cup of tea or nothing, in a poly bag, looking dishevelled, having had a rough night. Every possession she has is in her poly bag, which she, as originally did getting on the bus, covers around there's no reason for the police to check the contents of that bag. They have no right to. And it was locked away anyway, and they, she walks around like this. Late that morning, 
my brother is walking his dog and Sabina is across the road. Talk about <laughs> unfortunate timing. And apparently she's the one who spoke to him first and said, I like your dog, in some weird accent. And my brother said, thanks very much. And they got broke into a chat. What's his name? Blah de blah de blah. Troy. Got chatting. And Glenn looked at her, being a medical professional as he was, looked at her, thought he'd a bit of a mess. Could do with a cup of tea, maybe, you know, looking dishevelled, pissed off, smoking, freezing cold, not dressed for the occasion, of course, still in her crappy clothes from yesterday. But torn after being rubbed around on the M6, I suppose. Looking a bit manky, to be frank. And they said, well, you know, oh, my sister's in the hospital, I don't know what's happened to her. You know, Glenn didn't even go into why her sister's in the hospital. None of his business, he's like that. And she said, well, come to the hospital. My brother works at the hospital, you know, I'll find him up. And that's what happened. So, Glenn was seen with her you know, no shenanigans <laughs> with his dog and they both had a fag and Glenn went home with the beaner and a guy arrived which is Glenn's friend called Malloy and they cracked a few beers together apparently later on that day and this is when the phone call happened to my brother Paul to say what's happened with Sabina's sister Anyway, this was at the time Sabina said she was too ill, she had a headache. And Glenn said, well, OK, look, you can take a rest, you can chill out here, you can sleep on my city, I don't care, which DNA tests were done, by the way. And uh, there was no way that they cohabited or any sexual liaison at all on that night. And she stayed. And Malloy apparently came had a couple of beers, had a couple of fags and pissed off and said he would see Glenn the following morning. As boys do. Glenn just rolled his eyes and you know, let the neighbours talk. But Glenn was seriously concerned about her and Malloy, it transpires, thought there was a little something of the night about Sabina. Thought Glenn could handle himself, which he could. So apparently, Malloy had gone home, living 300 yards up the road from Glenn. Ah, and he'd known Malloy a long time, not well, but enough to go drinking with him occasionally. And then we're on to the day of the murder. And the day starts as any other normal day would start. And we'll do another video tomorrow where we'll do the meat and veg. We've had the starter. So now we have Glenn and Sabina alone in Glenn's house, allegedly alone, with a psycho in the White House, as they say, just as they have in America. No. They have a female in distress, a knight in shining armour, and a damsel in distress at the hospital. It will be an interesting video tomorrow, folks. Trust me. It will all come out in the wash. Make a bloody good film. I don't think MI6 will like that. Catch you tomorrow. And I hope this satiates the many email requests I get from people who know my face. I'm not a man of mystery, but I do like just to put the record straight. And there's nothing worse than Chinese whisper. You're getting it from the horse's mouth. I know a long face like horse. What a long face. <laughs> yes. Well, folks, tired old day today. And I'll catch you Tomorrow, we'll do another video, and you'll be one step closer to knowing the truth. 
and on the third hour or the third video you'll know as just as much as anybody else in the world and in fact as much as the family know and I want you to know and then you'll be able to have a true opinion of the slap shit police force we have in this country not to mention the corrupt legal system and the media sycophantic press who are a bunch of lying scum nothing new is that under the sun